The Thing at Nolan by Ambrose Bierce To the south of where the road between Leesville and Hardy, in the state of Missouri, crosses the east fork of May Creek, stands an abandoned house. Nobody has lived in it since the summer of 1879, and it is fast going to pieces. For some three years before the date mentioned above, it was occupied by the family of Charles May, from one of whose ancestors the creek near which it stands took its name. Mr. May's family consisted of a wife, an adult son, and two young girls. The son's name was John. The names of the daughters are unknown to the writer of this sketch. John May was of a morose and surly disposition, not easily moved to anger, but having an uncommon gift of sullen, implacable hate. His father was otherwise, of a sunny, jovial disposition, but with a quick temper like a sudden flame kindled to a wisp of straw, which consumes it in a flash. He cherished no resentments, and his anger gone, was quick to make overtures for reconciliation. He had a brother living nearby who was unlike him in respect to all this, and it was a current witticism in the neighborhood that John had inherited his disposition from his uncle. One day a misunderstanding arose between father and son. Harsh words ensued, and the father struck the son full in the face with his fist. John quietly wiped away the blood that followed the blow, fixed his eyes upon the already penitent offender, and said, with cold composure, You will die for that. The words were overheard by two brothers named Jackson, who were approaching the men at the moment, but seeing them engaged in a quarrel, they retired, apparently unobserved. Charles May afterward related the unfortunate occurrence to his wife, and explained that he had apologized to the son for the hasty blow, but without avail. The young man not only rejected his overtures, but refused to withdraw his terrible threat. Nevertheless, there was no open rupture of relationships. John continued living with the family, and things went on very much as before. One Sunday morning in June 1879, about two weeks after what has been related, May Sr. left the house immediately after breakfast, taking a spade. He said he was going to make an excavation of a certain spring in the wood about a mile away, so that the cattle could obtain water. John remained in the house for some hours, variously occupied with shaving himself, writing letters, and reading a newspaper. His manner was very nearly what it usually was. Perhaps he was a trifle more sullen and surly. At two o'clock he left the house. At five he returned. For some reason not connected with any interest in his movements, and which is not now recalled, the time of his departure and that of his return were noted by his mother and sisters, as was attested at his trial for murder. It was observed that his clothing was wet in spots, as if, so the prosecution afterward pointed out, he had been removing bloodstains from it. His manner was strange. He looked wild. He complained of illness, and going to his room, took to his bed. May Sr. did not return. Later that evening the nearest neighbors were aroused and during that night and the following day a search was prosecuted through the woods where the spring was it resulted in little but the discovery of both men's footprints in the clay about the spring john may in the meantime had grown rapidly worse with what the local physician called brain fever and in his delirium raved of murder but did not say whom he conceived to have murdered nor whom he imagined to have done the deed. But his threat was recalled by the brothers Jackson, and he was arrested on suspicion, and a deputy sheriff put in charge of him at his home. 
public opinion ran strongly against him and but for his illness he would probably have been hanged by a mob as it was a meeting of the neighbors was held on tuesday and a committee appointed to watch the case and take such action at any time as circumstance might seem to warrant on wednesday all was changed from the town of noland eight miles away came a story which put a quite different light on the matter nolan consisted of a schoolhouse a blacksmith's shop a store and a half dozen dwellings the store was kept by one henry odell a cousin of the elder may on the afternoon of sunday of may's disappearance mr odell and four of his neighbors men of credibility were sitting in the store smoking and talking it was a warm day and both the front and back doors were open at about three o'clock charles may who was well known to three of them entered at the front door and passed out at the rear he was without hat or coat he did not look at them nor return their greetings a circumstance which did not surprise for he was evidently seriously hurt above the left eyebrow was a wound a deep gash from which the blood flowed covering the whole left side of the face and neck and saturating his light gray shirt oddly enough the thought upmost in the minds of all was that he had been fighting and was going to the brook directly at the back of the store to wash himself perhaps there was a feeling of delicacy a backwoods etiquette that restrained them from following him to offer assistance the court records from which mainly this narrative is drawn are silent as to anything but the fact they waited for him to return but he did not return bordering the brook behind the store is a forest extending about six miles back to the medicine lodge hills as soon as it became known in the neighborhood of the missing man's dwelling that he had been seen in nolan there was a marked alteration in public sentiment and feeling the vigilance committee went out of existence without a formal resolution search along the wooded bottomlands of may creek was stopped and nearly the entire male population of the region took to beating the bushes about nolan and in the medicine lodge hills but of the missing man no trace was found one of the strangest circumstances of this strange case is the formal indictment and trial of a man for murder of one whose body no human being professed to have seen one not known to be dead we are all more or less familiar with the vagaries and eccentricities of frontier law but this instance as is thought is unique however that may be it is of record that on recovering from his illness john may was indicted for the murder of his missing father counsel for the defense appears not to have demurred and the case was tried on its merits the prosecution was spiritless and perfunctory the defense easily established with regard to the deceased an alibi if during the time in which john may must have killed charles may if he killed him at all charles may was miles away from where john may must have been it is plain that the deceased must have come to his death at the hands of someone else john may was acquitted he immediately left the country and has never been heard of from that day shortly afterward his mother and sisters removed to st louis the farm having passed into the possession of a man who owns the land adjoining and has a dwelling of his own the may house has ever since been vacant and has a somber reputation of being haunted one day after the may family had left the country some boys playing in the woods along may creek found concealed under a mass of dead leaves but partially exposed by the rooting of hogs a spade 
nearly new and bright except for a spot on one edge which was rusted and stained with blood the implement had the initials cm cut into the handle this discovery renewed in some degree the public excitement of a few months before the earth near the spot where the spade was found was carefully examined and the result was the finding of a dead body of a man it had been buried under two or three feet of soil and the spot covered with a layer of dead leaves and twigs there was but little decomposition a fact attributed to some preservative property in the mineral bearing soil above the left eyebrow was a wound a deep gash from which blood had flowed covering the whole left side of the face and neck and saturating the light gray shirt the skull had been cut through by the blow the body was that of Charles May but what was it that passed through mr. Odell's store at Nolan the end of the thing at Nolan by Ambrose Bierce